Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to actually welcome Sue Gordon, who's, I guess her title fully is the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. Now, uh, Sue, can you come out here? We're going we're gonna to sit here. Amazing. You want to sit together? And, uh, the few, the mighty, the tough, the proud. I love it. <laughs> yes, the, yes they're, they're pretty proud to be here. That's, you should have seen their faces when we talked. <laughs> but uh, Sue is actually a great friend of mine. And, uh, the reason why I say that is because I admire you. Back at you, you're America. Oh, yeah. You know? No, 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 right? <laughs> no, no, her. Like inspiring, great purpose, great quest, great achievement. Yeah. I'm a fan. You're a fan. I'm a fan too. It's great. What should we talk about? Uh, anything. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these people can ask you any question. Yeah, yeah. I know, I mean, it's, it's intimate. It is intimate. I mean, what I, what I know about Sue is that I watched her transform NGA. She had a digital transformation vision. Uh, a few years ago when we met, you started to squeeze me, say, Jack, do this, Jack, do that, and then... Isn't, we isn't... have our own story of, <laughs> of that. Well, as you can see, we laugh about it. But she actually was the powerhouse behind the IC portal, which now has 112,000 users, 25,000 hits a day. It's, it's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. I mean, congratulations to you. You all get to use it. She was the, yeah, she was the powerhouse between, be, behind modernization of all the foundation uh, databases. You've been away from us for a few years. You've been moving up in the world. You've become this deputy director of national intelligence, which is just an crazy, crazy. I crazy. mean, how has it changed your life? Uh, so what? An amazing time to be in intelligence. Uh, when I, I love our craft um, uh, because it's a craft of possibility, right? And it's a craft of responsibility. It's like if we could be really good at our job and understand with clarity um, what's happening in the world then we can enable better decisions. And my gosh, if there was a time that needed great decision making, it's certainly right now when the world just seems to have gone nuts on us. And we could talk later about why I think uh, the world is so challenging. Um, but the combination of our craft intelligence, uh, the moment, which is a world that, um, listen, there have always been challenges, but there's a complexity to understanding it right now that, and we'll get to talking about this, but I think GIS and um, geography are both so important to the moment. Um, but this is also a very action-oriented administration. And I think over the course of my career, I've seen a lot of uh, administrations. Um, some are more like we're predisposed to be. We, we like being thinkers, and we've had administrations that were thinkers and wanted to know more. This is an administration with a penchant for action, and it's putting really interesting um, tests on us as intelligence officers uh, to meet uh, the decision-making time frames uh, that this administration wants to have, so it's a great time. The DNI has the responsibility uh, we're, we're a staff element uh, formed after 9-11 to really make sure that the best of the intelligence community could come together at any moment of decision. So there are 16 um, plus one, my um, agencies, uh, that are participating in this great quest. And our job is to do two things, bring together the best they have and then provide the um, oversight and policy and administration and infrastructure that allows each one of them to do their jobs really well. Being the deputy is, um, for anyone who's been a deputy out there, they, it's, you know, we should have a support club because it's just fascinating. <laughs> it's a fascinating position. But actually for me, it, uh, it suits in that it's kind of in the coal room doing things, right? And, uh, so it's a great time to be overseeing a community that wants to meet this moment and is thirsting for an organizing principle that we hope is the ODNI. So it's about, I mean, the word that comes to my mind is integration. Mm -hmm. You've, you're really in charge of coordinating the different 16 agencies 
and also integrating their information. Right. Right. Do you do the integration, or does do they integrate themselves, or how, how does this actually work? Uh, so at the ODNI, integration is our primary function, um, and the one um, that for which we are. Uh, most recognized and I would say most successful. We have what we call mission managers um, for various um, groupings of disciplines. So we have mission managers for Russia, Eurasia, Near East. We also have mission managers for cyber, for transnational issues, uh, for Western Hemisphere, for threat finance and economic security. Um, but these are people that are responsible for in those areas um, doing two things. Uh, in the immediate uh, grabbing uh, the best of what we have to offer and making it available. And then second, uh, working to make sure that tomorrow we have better than we had today. And so that's how we do it. But it is all predicated on uh, the foundational work that goes on at the agency. But they don't, all, all the agencies don't work for you. Yeah. You, you kind of coordinate them and integrate their knowledge? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, it's an I'm interesting sorry, question. I was trying to decide. So, no, we're a loose confederation of independent agencies, and I, re I think the real strength of the intelligence community is the fact that we are agency-centric in our execution so that that allows um, the excellence and the craft of each one of the agencies to come to bear. When the ODNI does a really good job, it's when we provide some found fundamental infrastructure, whether it's the ICGIS portal, yes. whether it's eyesight that we've done, or a policy that allows information sharing in different ways that we've had. This intelligence integration piece is a element mm -hmm. of infrastructure in a worse way, but the strength is really in the agencies themselves. Yeah, the, the big vision, for those of you not familiar with this community, has been that GIS, and geography, you already said this, can be an integrating principle at the information level. You bring human intelligence, image intelligence, signal intelligence together and you fuse it. And I, I think in many ways your background through both CIA and then at NGA, you got this idea of bringing it together. Uh, is, this, is this really, can you see this at the DNI level that people get this idea? So first things first. Um, 34 year CIA officer. Um, I love that organization. I've never been an adult without it. Um, and I, I love that within the CIA it has a number of disciplines, so it is integrating itself between um, operations, ST, support, and analysis. But I didn't get um, this idea of the importance of context until I went to NGA. And then it just left, it took about a minute and a half to leap off the page to me, um, that time and space um, makes everything better, makes everything clearer, every issue. So at NGA, we do a lot of content in terms of imagery, um, but we provide context to every issue, regardless of whether our content plays into it. Um, certainly now being someone who spends a fair amount of time with this administration, um, I would say that hardly an encounter with the president goes by that we don't put some sort of contextual information, most often a map, um, in front of him that allows him to see things. And whether that is what's going on in the Euphrates River Valley um, in terms of warring factions, whether that's humanitarian crises between Burma and Bangladesh, when you can see it, or quite frankly, um, if you were to take all the activities uh, of China overseas in the past five years, how they've expanded geographically and functionally in various areas from political to technological um, uh, to physical presence and you can show that over time, it just jumps off the page what is happening differently. So um, certainly at the intelligence community we now see it. Personally my journey almost had to take me through NGA in order to be able to understand this lesson and now I think contextually any time an issue presents itself. It just makes it better. Time and space makes everything better. 
Well, I wanted you to say maps make everything better, but time and space will do. I mean, right. Right. these guys love maps, right? Okay, Don't you? maps are the, are the best ever. I oh, love oh great, yes. <laughs> so do you use maps? What I, what I heard you say yep. is that you use maps for briefing Out. the president. Almost every time. Is that right? Almost every time. And does he like them? Uh, he does. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a visual, active guy. He wants to do things, including with the intelligence he gets. So if I can give him a map that he can look at, play with, mm -hmm. um, envision, turn. And you, you know, isn't it funny when we have maps? Yeah. <laughs> I like physical maps in their own way, not just the maps on the screen, because there's a tactile element to be yeah. able to, to, you know, to be able to play with it, look at it, right, look down at it. Um, and the president is very much that way. So does he ever mark on them? Um, I don't know that I recall him, but more often than not, when we go into principals' meetings, when we're making decisions, I, I think a map is part of almost every presentation that we do and use. And if it's not a map, it's geospatial information in tabular form. And I think that's one of the things exciting that's coming in this environment of massive data and systems that allow us to combine lots of data sets. The combination of a map plus geospatial data presented differently um, is really powerful. What are some of the challenges that you're facing? I mean, I could say something funny like, where's your pain? <clears throat> but um, So I still think we have a ways to go um, to make uh, integration of data free uh, to the users. I think still we work way too hard. We make people way too hard to bring multiple sources of data together. I just, Excalibur, is that what I just yeah, saw? Yeah, right. Holy smokes. I mean, that's a great example of, I could always do that, but the cost of doing that in terms of time or energy or preparation or agreement. So, so I think we still have pain in terms of integrating multiple data sets. Um, is one, so we should keep pushing on that. Um, I think we still have pain uh, in terms of making what one coalition of people on one system can do, make that available to everyone else. Will you allow me to digress for a second about sure. the digital environment? So the digital environment has both enabled and wrecked us. And one of the ways it's wrecked us is that Information can now go past physical organizational barriers that we constructed to make sense of our lives. And so you can think cyber in terms of the barrier that we constructed between the federal government and the private sector. The digital environment doesn't care about that. And so you have people from governments going directly to the private sector and yet I can't figure out how to go and meet them there to help them, mm -hmm. right? or even elections that interference that crosses the boundary between federal and state. And we have rules set up to keep those, those boundaries. So what's interesting to me, or federal, state, local, tribal, or um, public, private, or government and NGOs. And so we have a lot of barriers. Um, the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, mm -hmm. um, top secret and unclassified. And so, all of a sudden, information wants to move past those barriers, but our systems are designed as those are barriers exist. And so I think those are some of the things that still vex us, where I want to make um, intelligence community available all the way downrange um, to a soldier in the field. We know they can use it, but our systems weren't designed to get them there. So sure. if the first one is just integration, the second is connectivity. The third probably will become uh, allowing our data to be able to be acted on by machines. I think sometimes we're still manipulating our data and marking our data and tagging our data as though humans want to work on it. And I think we have to think about when machines want to work on it, because we're going to want some of those things to be happening. I'm not sure that our schemas um, are the same. And then probably the last challenge I have, and I'm thinking in the domain of, of geography and GIS, um, is there are some things I think we still have a hard time showing. And um, my favorite, and Jack and I have talked about this for the four years we've known each other, 
is I think we still don't see digital activity very well, and so we have a hard time understanding it. I mean, it has behaviors, and there are patterns to it, and I think we just can't see it as easily as I can see a topographic layer. And if you I think see, like things like cyber cyber terrorism yeah, or just, happening invisibly yeah, in the network, just, how do you yeah, spatialize I mean, them? What does massing at the border look like in <coughs> cyberspace? And I just I don't think I. I don't think we can yet describe it in a manner that people can see it. And this seeing things is something really... So we don't have the language visually, like the patterns, like if you thought about it as a map right. symbol, here's, right. here's a group of people at a right. border, right. terror, whatever. Uh, we what don't do, have that in our vocabulary like, what cartographically. What do bots look like and where do they come from? And I think yeah. time, now that we can do really interesting things with time in terms of hypertemporal measurements, mm -hmm. we could probably even break some of the movements down. So that's one. I think we just have a hard time. The other one is almost vexing because it feels like this is our, our core is, I don't think we show human activity well enough. Um, whether it is humanitarian crisis or mass migration or things. It's just, it's just hard for us to produce a map that displays human activity in a way that allows us to understand more about it than we do just by describing it. Um, so whether it's Are cultural... You mean like the connectedness, like mm -hmm. networks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We're starting, the audience saw some of that yesterday. We were trying to apply these um, network charts. In, so you see the, the, where the people are on the map and you see also this hierarchical network uh, right. or link, link analysis, that sort of thing. But so that's, to, that's kind of a frontier, I would say. But just, we'll just choose um, refugees, um, migration, and impact on the human geography of a region. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the great egress of people from uh, the war-torn Middle East, that's just on my mind right now, going north into Europe, seeing that pattern, the rate at which it occurs, and then looking at its impact on the relatively small populations of European countries to understand how the cultural aspects of those are changing. I think that is a, in my head, it's a visual problem. When we try and produce products that show that, I mm -hmm. think we're still wanting. Yes. It's a and story. I think that, and I think that would help, right? It's a story right. in, your, in your mind. You know this story. So this story maps are about as far as we've been able to take it. But what you're saying is we're still lacking right. I think being so. able to present this and people really just get it. Yeah, so I mean, this is a, you know, little known, uh, for a president that is talked about a lot all the time, I think one of the things that isn't talked about as much is, uh, he, he feels humanitarian crises. I mean, I don't know it's, whether it's because he's the dad, but I've been in with him a lot. I would love to be able to show him better mm -hmm. what's what a, happening. Yes, so he could feel it right. through and the then, map. And then you yeah. could then, because I said he's, this administration has a bench for action, it, it's like we could show it, maybe you could find some path. So I think those are two things that we Alan totally Carroll, as you know, is backstage, the guy that used to, Alan Carroll's the inventor of story maps, for those of you who don't know him, he's an amazing cartographer and storyteller. He's the guy who invented story maps. He's listening, yeah. so well, maybe he can give so you an is, answer. So, so is Liz Lyon at NGA, whether she's here yeah. or whether she hears it at some point, she's going to say, oh, I'm so proud of her. She's so human geography. And so are a lot geography. of people right here listening. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Well, look, um, can I change the subject? Anytime. Really? Or yeah. do you have questions of me? Uh, how'd you get so smart so young? Um, no, no, no. So give me, will you allow me for a second on this? Um, I, I think the reason why I have such uh, affection for Affinity, um, uh, for Jack, and, and for what he's built at ESRI and what you all uh, participate in is um, uh, people with vision about what could be that is for great purpose, and then have the wherewithal to turn it into action. So there are lots of philosopher princes out there that, that, that can see a world that should be and you know, shake their fist at the cosmos of why it's not. But to be able to both hold a vision and then to turn it into some set of action that benefits 
uh, not only America, but America's interests, which tend to be broad societal, man, that's a hero in my book. It's what I try and do. I think it's what the government tries to do, but I think it's what represents here. And every time I come and I see something more you've done, I'm inspired by what, may, what you saw in terms of potential benefit that we could do. And so I'm just kind of in awe of that. So, you know, what question is, how'd you, how'd you get there, right? Well. Right, how you, you know, what was, I don't know that anyone asked you in terms of your journey. You make it look easy. Um, I, there's no way this is easy. I, I'm a fellow traveler with you. This is not easy stuff. It, I think sometimes it's just believing you're supposed to, right? Yeah. I think being interested mm -hmm. and being genuine and being kind, yeah. I mean, I'll just turn it right around because you're a woman now at a yes. very senior position. Oh, yeah. You are, right? I think you are, you see. Uh, but, I mean, uh, what I've done is watched what you do with other women around you. I mean, you create a place of nurturement, and whether you're a man or a woman in this audience, you should really look at Sue. I mean, she's just amazing, because she sort of drags along, I guess it's not just women, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. You touch people, but you reach out, and you show the way, I mean, that's a phrase, I guess, from NGA, but you actually show the way of, of opening up opportunities for achievement. I mean, you just break them all down and go for it. I mean, can, do you have anything to share with this audience, men and women, about this? Because it's, it's uh, pretty, pretty amazing. That's, it's one of, one of the remarkable things that I, that I like about you. Yeah, so one, you said something that I think you should hold in your hearts. You said just be interested, right? Yes. Right, and I, I think that's something maybe you and I share is just kind of a fundamental curiosity that makes you wonder, well, what if we could do that? Um, uh, so we talk a lot about culture and, and cultural change, and one of the favorite line, one of the common lines is um, cultural will beat strategy every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Well, I say leadership and, and quest create culture, mm. right? So. Um, early on, I, I experienced a, um, I had great opportunity, and I almost did it well, except I kind of didn't, tragically. <laughs> and, and when I went to my boss and, and kind of shared the epicness of this failure, my boss said, eh, I've seen worse. <laughs> and I thought, ah, that's, that's the kind of boss I want to be. Um, that can always say to my people that I've seen worse, because what that allowed in me is now I could be really big, because I knew that no matter how big I was, even if I failed, I had a boss there that was like, yeah, I've seen worse, right? And I wanted to become that. Nurturing, so, nurturing. Yeah, nurturing. nurturing. So here's my big piece of advice. Um, you have to be good at your job. <laughs> you know, I, we don't talk about that enough. You do work at being good. If you're a leader, be good at being a leader. If you're, uh, if you're an analyst, be great at being an analyst. We don't talk about it. You have to be good. The reason why you've been so successful is because you're also good. It isn't enough, but it is necessary. Yeah. Um, be big. You know, you, you hold some position. Don't execute it small. Execute it big, you know, ask, ask the question about where it should go. That doesn't mean be a dilettante, but, but be big. Um, be bold about stuff. Um, I, I say this all the time, no organization has enough energy to stop somebody who does. And most of the barriers in organizations are semi-artificial. Uh, they weren't actually designed to stop you, they were just designed to keep control. If you account for them, you can move forward. Um, learn to make decisions. Uh, it's really rare. Uh, I think human beings want to wait so that every decision becomes an equation and it has no risk in it. Um, too late, right? If the world turning is going to solve the problem, you haven't made a decision. And all the great people learn to make decisions. And, and if you have people working for you, give them responsibility young. And the last one is, you mentioned it, be kind. I, you know, there are just so many things that are now coming to light um, societally that suggest that we have for too long made people choose between doing the mission they want and being treated de de decently, right? And people make that choice because we all will. I want this, so I'll put up with that. How dumb is that? That is dumb, yeah. Don't, don't make pe anyone choose. You get to have both. You both get to do something great and you get to be treated 
decently as a human, so be kind to people, because everyone's fighting a great battle. That's it. That's about, that's about it. And I've got no discernible skills, so if I've been successful, that's all I've done, and it's worked out okay. Yeah. So it's available to you, because so. I bet you all have more skills than I do. Amazing. That's wonderful. Hey. Look, <clears throat> where, do I, where do I go with that? I mean, <clears throat> oh, let's talk about self-driving cars. Yeah, why don't? I mean, what do you think the future is going to be like with technology? I mean, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, you track it all the time. Yeah, I do. You're worse than me. I am. I'm kind of nerdy that way. Um, uh, so it's a technical world, so two things. Uh, tell your kids, get a STEM education, do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's good, and um, the second thing, if you're a leader, um, you have to be a technical leader now. They're just, you know, technology isn't going to be done by someone else. I think a lot about technology. I think it's awesome. I think, I think we still think too small about it, about how we're going to digitize or modernize the tasks we're doing now, and some of the technologies really need to just leap over some of the things we're doing right now. So I was having a conversation the other day about self-driving cars. Uh, and they'll happen. Um, and there was just an accident that everyone's going to go, horror, horror, we need to slow. But let's just think about it. If there are 30,000 accidents a year caused by human error, and in self-driving car, that number of accident goes down to 5,000, that's a better world. Right? And so I think we've got to think about it that way. Um, but here's what the person said. I thought they were so true and frightening and now worrisome. Um, they said, Our, my grandchildren are never going to learn how to drive a car. Think about that, because why would they, right? Because driving yourself, I mean, we can do so many interesting things with transportation. Why would you, even if it's a self-driving car, why would you own one? Why would you leave something sitting in your garage 60% of the time just depreciating? Traffic would go away because self-driving cars would learn with each other. You could do work in the car or sing in the car or talk to your kids in the car because you're not doing it. So that all sounds great. And I thought, oh, that's so true. I hadn't thought about it. And then I, this is going to become relevant to you in a minute, trust me. Um, and then I had this thought, how are, so I really love geography and I love GIS because I think it is, I call, people mock me for this, I think it's, it's accessible STEM. It's like your first introduction to STEM because you are doing all those fundamental skills, but you're doing it in a context and in a manner that allows you to be able to see how to play with it. And most of us really learned geography when we started driving cars. Back to my time in space, right? Learned relations of things, things you have to account for, truth about elevation, all those sorts of things. So if my two suppositions are true, that geography is foundational to the skill we most need. And we're gonna, the best way to learn that in practice is by driving a car. How are we gonna give people that experiences? They used to get it because we didn't have cars and they hiked all around or rode bikes and you get the same experience, right? You do orienteering. So that's my challenge to the audience. If it is true that driving is gonna be the same thing of the past, how are we going to get that experience into lives early because geography is so fundamental to understanding the world? That's my challenge. I think you're, describing, I think you're describing navigation yeah. and the eye-brain cognitive yeah. reasoning process of navigating, learning navigating. I mean, there's been studies by National Geographic and the National Academy about the younger people learn navigation skills especially in a computation environment, the more they learn in other fields. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It is. Can I ask you one more question? You can ask me anything. What is science fiction in this field to you right now? Oh. The, because if, when he says it, we know what's going to happen. So. God. <laughs> it's what they all wanted to know. They what's, sent me cards at home, right? Yeah, what's science fiction to you um, in this field? AR, VR, machine learning. But those, we saw it yesterday right. actually popping into place, uh, which basically builds, by the way, on some of your big data things that you were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, I, I, I don't, what science fiction was five years ago is starting to be realized. Right. Like the AI 
uh, yep. machine learning yep. stuff. We used to poo-poo it. Yeah, you can't call no, that science fiction anymore. Not it's really, happening. because we're turning it into practical yeah. tools. And, and I think that that's the same with self-driving cars. I used to poo-poo it too, but now I'm starting to, yeah, I get, I get how it's going to be transformational and what's happening. So I'll simply say this in response. I stay constantly trying to learn technology. It's one of the things that I just, I'm not just only passionate about it, but I realize that as a leader, you just have to do it. You have to just strive to learn, 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 because it's happening so fast. Um, you know, yeah. and in that context for you, ladies and gentlemen, the thing is not just being at the effect of technology, oh, I got to learn something new, but turning it around to the contextual thing as you described it and being the cause of change. Yeah. That means really knowing enough about it so that you can create the future, not being at the effect of the future. Right. That's a big yeah, deal for me. Could, uh, my, my kind of similar question is, what if we could? Like, what if we could do this? Yeah. So in those self-driving cars, what if yes. we could geotag all music by birthplace of the author and where they wrote the song, oh, or cool. how the song were referenced, and then as your self-driving cars travel across the United States, on the on the radio would become the a blues selection. Down in, right, in, uh, right. You go to Louisiana. you're in southeastern Texas, and yeah. you and the Doobie Brothers come on singing China Grove. Yeah. Like, that's wouldn't that be cool. cool, right? Go into L.A. and listen to Will like, I Am. So we could totally sell this to Chevrolet. <laughs> Why do we do it? Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's acknowledge Sue Gordon, an amazing American leader. Thank you, Sue. She was just amazing. Thanks so much.